I am Justin Gatlin. This is Ready, Set, Go. We're going to get right into it. All right. Diving right in? Diving right in. What was that first day like in the courtroom and you realized you couldn't do what you loved anymore? You ever had a dream or a nightmare, but in the dream or nightmare, you feel like you're awake? That's what I felt like. I felt everything felt surreal. Um, I was beside myself, man. Like, for real. Who was your mom? And did you look at her face? Was you in a courtroom and you realized, this is it? Or what your dad say? What your family say? Were they there? Yeah. Mom was there. Dad was there. Uh, first day of court, I was nervous, man. Um, i never been to court in my life. I always pitch myself as the good guy. And I always feel like all the things that I've done in my career, my life, were always driven towards doing good things, right? So being in that courtroom and being painted as the bad guy was jarring. Um, I remember the lawyer who was working with USADA at that time. We would, we would go on break and he would talk so nice. Hey, man, you doing all right? Doing good? Yeah, man. Mr. and Mrs. Gatlin, you have, a, you, have a, you have a good son, really good son. And as soon as the break was over, he would get in the courtroom and be like, and then Mr. Gatlin, <laughs> he would proceed to just, just put me in the fire, man. Like, that's what it, it just felt like. It felt like it was never going to end. Wow, that's crazy. Do you... Did you feel a sense of, even though your family members was there, did you feel a sense of loneliness? Because, you know, even though we say we have our family and we enter the track or anything like that, we say on your marks, you're lonely. And then when you receive everything, it's just your name on there, even though they're with you. Did you feel like alone when he was like, Mr. Gatlin? I never felt alone. In my career. My parents have been with me throughout my whole career, through all my ups and downs, bro. Like, um, the hardest part for me wasn't to feel lonely. It was actually the fact that I can see how it was physically breaking my parents down. Like, my mom was losing hair. My dad was becoming depressed. Like, you realize that my circle's tight. I'm yeah. close with my mom and dad. And they've always been my rock. And watching them deteriorate spiritually and physically was the most upsetting thing I had to go through. My mom said she was all prayed out. She said she didn't know what to pray for anymore. Wow. That's, that's, that's crazy. And mental health wasn't even heavy around back that time. Uh, did you get, or did they get any help through it? Like through a pastor or through any type of counseling? No, nah, man. I mean... When you come from a black community, mental health was a, was a sign of weakness. You know what I mean? So, it, it was a situation where we didn't know what to do. If we felt like a zombie every day. You woke up, you went to court, you fought for your life, you ate dinner. Went to sleep. You woke up. You went to court. You fought for your life. So that's what it felt like the whole time. It felt like I was in a, a weird cycle, and that was never ending. Was there ever a point to where you felt like today I could win, or today I lost, and that is is it? It's like. 
Did you feel like you could win at any point or did you feel like the cards were already stacked up against you? For me, it wasn't winning or losing. I thought that it was a misunderstanding, to be honest. I thought it was a misunderstanding. I cooperated. I helped as much as I could. I felt at the end, something was going to come up and I was going to be exonerated. That never happened. How'd you feel when that didn't happen? Lost. I felt my purpose was taken away from me. I always was the center of attention when it came to especially being in home, like Pensacola, and uh, amongst my people, track and field. So I felt like oh, it'll straighten, it'll straighten itself out. It never did. <laughs> well, kind of, because we sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of. I mean, that's 2020 <laughs> hindsight. That's 2020 hindsight. I remember going to court. I remember one time where I physically became ill from stress. Wow. Like fever, throwing up, body aches, all because of the stress. It started to get to me where I realized that there wasn't going to be a good ending to this situation. And as the days went on and as the, the news and newspapers were writing about my stories, they became more negative and as the days went on. Um, did somebody tell you not to read them or did you read them anyway? Because you know they say once you become famous, you don't read or Google yourself because you'll find out everybody that don't like you. No, no one's ever told me that. Wow. So, you know, but you got to realize from that point before I was winning everything, I was winning medals, awards. So I didn't mind reading about myself. And in fact, I enjoyed reading about myself because all the hard work I put in, it was being praised. Mm. So now I was getting a crash course of what it looked like to receive negative press. Negative press. Exactly, man. Like. That's where I was. And to this day, it's hard for me to read about myself in articles, regardless of what it's about, because of that. My name was Mud. I was drug, I was drug all through that mud, dog. Like, it was the worst feeling ever. Yeah, I can't imagine. I can't imagine because it's, it's like battling. It's not just battling the courtroom. You have to battle these people who live overseas who have an opinion. Uh, and like Instagram and stuff wasn't out then, so it's like reading about yourself in the London Times and and all these overseas magazines, and you're like they don't have the full story, but everybody has a, a executed opinion on what they think or what they think happened without having the facts. So that had to have been like really, really, really tough for you. Another thing. Um, days prior, like, the day you found out that you had to go to court, what was that like? That this is, since you've never been and you found out, you know, you know you have a paper in you saying that you're ineligible to do what you do, but, but now you have to go to court for this and testify or try to get your name cleared. What was that like? It was a, um, a confusing feeling. Because going through my whole adult life, all I know was, was track and field. That's it, you know? So now I'm in a situation where I'm fighting for my life. You know, I went through three lawyers in this whole process. Spent over a million dollars in lawyer fees alone. Yeah. And um, found out that what the system was really made it was made for people in my position to lose regardless. And we talk about that, you know. But then when I realized that I wasn't, it wasn't going to play in my favor, 
I didn't know what to do myself. Did you have a, did you have a big circle then? And like, yes, man, or a lot of people around you who you figured out wasn't there for you. But like, did you have a big circle? Um, it was, it was big. I mean, I'm Olympic champion, world champion, just broke the world record within what, less than a year. So I was getting a lot of, a lot of buzz, a lot of press, a lot of people who are who's who's Hollywood going to different parties. As soon as everything started falling apart, there was a lot of people who weren't picking their phones up anymore. A lot of people. I, yeah. I felt like I was in a movie, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> where you see like the hero or whatever you want to call them. Take that blow, that loss, that, that setback. I was in a situation where I had nobody except my parents. That's it. I cried for that first year, I cried every night. I'm not even exaggerating. I cried myself, I cried myself to sleep every night because I felt like I was in a, a nightmare and I wasn't waking up. That's tough. That's tough. That's tough. That's kind of unbearable. That, um, do your parents know you cried every night? No, I mean, I couldn't show that to my parents. They, they were my rock. We were supposed to be strong for each other. I think for them to know that their baby boy was in his house in North Carolina crying every night would break them. And it was at one point where my parents told me, just pack your stuff up and move home. And I did. I came back home. But as I did, I couldn't escape none of the negativity. Thinking I was at home in Pensacola, where I was a hometown hero, I've been okay. I felt like I was going to be loved by the community. I remember waking up one day, and um, the neighbor came over at like 7 o'clock in the morning. And he, uh, he was stuttering and he was saying to my mom, like, hey, I think you need to, um, there's something written on your truck outside. And I had a, um, a big Cadillac Escalade EXT that was painted like orange, right? Bright orange. You remember that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The these bright are, orange one. Call, it. It, yeah, juice on it or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had, it was sitting on 26 inch rims and everything, wow, right? Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> um, and the neighbor was like, I, I think, I think you need to come outside. There's, a, there's something on your truck. It's written on your truck. And I remember my mom was already up. She was getting ready to go out to the store and handle some business like that. You know, just trying to have a, a normal day mm -hmm. as we go on through what we'll be going through, right? And I remember me putting my clothes on and going outside. And on this bright orange truck was written steroids. With that homecoming marker that all the kids would use when they're trying to write for homecoming and things like that in high school, it was like down the whole side of the truck. And I remember, I remember wiping it off. Take it down. I remember wiping it off and then uh, going back inside the house and my mom acted normal and I let her act normal. And as soon as she left, I cried so hard into a pillow. I, I was screaming and yelling. I felt, I felt like a... Uh, I felt like I, I couldn't escape. I had nowhere to go then. Because like I said, I felt like I was at home. Hometown hero. And at that point, I didn't know where to turn, dog. I didn't know where to go. 
Oh, that's heavy. Shoot. Mid- Midway through that year, man, after that situation, mm-hmm. what were your thoughts about Corel Wise? What were you thinking of possibilities of things that you could do? Because I'm pretty sure it went through your mind. If I can't do this in the first year, what can I do? I love track and field, huh? I still trained. <laughs> Throughout the process of me being suspended and even going to court, I still would go in the morning and train. I would go back to my old high school. I would go train, and then I would go volunteer, help train the high school, co- high school kids. That's, that's all I knew. You got to realize that from high school, I got a scholarship. And then I went on to college. And then from college, I turned pro. Yes, and then after I turned pro, I won indoors. I won the Olympics the next year. I won the world championship next year. I won, I broke the world record the year after that. So all I knew in my life of, of being productive was track and field and being successful. So I didn't know what to do next. So I just kept doing what I knew, which was wake up every morning and practice. Wow. Yeah, I mean, when you, when, you, when you initially think about it, yeah, there, there was nothing else that you could think of to say, well, you were, you were one and done, correct? At, at Tennessee, one year and then you were finished? No, two. Two, two years. Done. Okay, yeah. two years. Okay. Two years. Wow. But you were still a baby. Yeah. <laughs> you turned pro at what, what age? Uh, 20 years old. 20. Yeah. Yeah, that's really a baby. And then I won the Olympics at 21. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm fast forwarding back to that time, like at 21, all of this is happening, 22. And then all of this crashed down at 23. Yeah. By that time, the world's, you feel the world is yours. And then now you feel like the world is gone. With everything that's happening. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's really tough. Um I think the hardest thing for me, especially that first year and the last couple of years after that, um it was the adverse effect of I was so proud to be who I was anywhere I went in public. Hey, Justin Gatlin. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. We got your picture on the wall. Hey, yeah. And then I went through my whole ordeal that first year. I've never been so embarrassed in my life of being me. It was a moment where I, f- I wish I couldn't be me anymore. But you never can escape that. Nah. I woke up every morning. I was me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Were there any happy moments in that year that you could think of that you could say, in my turmoil, this was a little piece of happiness from time to time or one time or any time? Yeah, I had happiness. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't joy. And why, what I mean by that is, over that, that first year going into the second year, I partied a lot. I met people who were helping me drown my sorrows. So my whole friendship dynamic changed big time. Like I was hanging with people who would party almost every, every day of the week. I was drinking so much. And you know me, I, I'm not yeah. a big drinker, man. Nah, nah, you know what nah, I'm saying? Nah, nah. I was, I, was, I was slamming like seven to eight Jaeger bombs every weekend. And in between, we were drinking like regular drinks. Um, sometimes I wake up, I don't even know where I'm at, whose house I'm at. Because I was so sad. And I just wanted not to be me no more. So- that I, I, would, I would purposely get drunk. So that was happiness for you? 
Just partying. I mean, the mixture of music and drunk people. <laughs> it, looking back at it, it was, it was, I was numbing the pain. Right. But it was happiness at a fleeting, a fleeting moment, you know? Right. But no, no signs of joy in that yet to say, I even, this happened to me and I felt like I forgot about what was going on in my life for a fraction of the moment. Yeah, I mean, those people never asked me any questions. Never said nothing about my career. Never asked me about track and field. Hell, I don't even think I even knew what track and field was. <laughs> I'm being serious. <laughs> wow. But I found friendship in them. You know, and um, they accepted me as just Justin not Justin Gap. And I think that was the only thing that kept me going daily was the fact that I had people who were cool with me for just being me. I see how individuals who either get banned or kicked out of sports and then they, they spiral down this like bad rabbit hole, right? And they and they end up, end up in the strip club throwing mount, mountains of money and doing crazy stuff. And then all of a sudden they get charged and locked up with DUIs and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? One bad thing leads to another bad thing, leads to another bad thing. And then that person is somewhere dead or in jail or something like that. So this, is, this, is, this would be a question and possibly like figuring out how did you get out of that? Because if you were in that, what saved you from that? Because anybody in a situation like that, at that point, even six months in, may feel suicide, may feel uh, stuff like that. You know what I mean? So what saved you? What had you to the point of this, this, this can't be it? I'm going to touch on that. So I'm going to go back to those few of those words you spoke on. Um, I don't even know. I don't even, I don't even know if it really was suicide or suicidal, but I had, I didn't, I didn't value my life as much as I, I did and do now. And what I mean by that is I became more reckless. My heart hurt a lot. A lot. It's a, it's a lot of emotional pain. Emotional pain is one of the pains where people don't want to deal with. It's why they do things like party, drugs, things like that, because it, it doesn't heal like a regular wound. You, you get a cut on your arm, you could actually see the scabs coming. Emotional pain. Yeah. It takes either time or you never get over it. So the moment that I knew that I was going down a bad path, it was going to be worse for me than what I was dealing with. It was one night I was so drunk that my vision was blurry. And um, I was on Pensacola Beach and I was leaving a club. And I remember I was in my Porsche Carrera, 911. And I rolled over a boulder and a cop came up to my car. He said, hey, you didn't see that rock right there? I was like, no, I didn't see that. And I know I smelled like alcohol, but I, he knew who I was. And he was like, all right, man, just be safe. I was like, shit, I'm good, I'm good, you know? And then the bridge that connects the mainland to the beach where I was, it's a three mile bridge, just straight three miles. And now, mind you, my vision is blurry, and I'm in a sports car. And for whatever reason, when I got on that bridge, I was so drunk and intoxicated. Uh, I was so scared that I wasn't going to be able to drive. And all the friends I was with already left. I got off that. I made it across that bridge. And I, when I got off that bridge, 
that was the moment I knew that I couldn't live this lifestyle no more. I could have died on that bridge. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. I could have had a DUI right there in the parking lot. Dodged that. True. Could have died on that bridge. That car could have flipped over off, off the bridge into the water. No one would know where I was. Pitch black. Three o'clock in the morning. But that goes to what you said about how one thing can spiral to the other. I'm pretty sure when the night started, it wasn't with the intention to get that drunk. But oh yes, it was. <laughs> the intention was to get that drunk. Oh, okay. Okay. The intention was to get as drunk as I can get without throwing up. That's, that's not that right. But you there. already that's, know how I throw up. <laughs> I throw up very violently. <laughs> That's how I throw up. Ribs are touching each other. But I think I had a moment when I came off that bridge and realizing that as much pain that you could say that I delivered or the situation that I was in, that was not only given to me, but the pain that my parents were going through. They wouldn't be able to live with themselves if I, I killed myself uh, or, or if I went to jail. 100%. No parent. No, and I, I've met, I've met Miss Gatlin. Love Miss Gatlin. <laughs> and she, she wouldn't be able to deal. Mr. Gatlin neither, but Miss Gatlin, I, yeah, she leaves an impression on you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my, all my friends back then called her, called her the assassin. Listen. She's legendary. I call her gangster boo. Listen, <laughs> I, I don't want no problems with Miss Gatlin. That's who, that's who she is, man. <laughs> Still to this day. <laughs> man, that's crazy. But yeah, that's, that's good that you had them by your side. I, I'm very grateful that you didn't, you didn't, ha anything happened to you because I, I really value our friendship, you know, where it started and everything else. But we never would have met each other, man. Never. You'd be like, man, remember Justin Gatlin, man? Yeah, he never. somewhere down in the Pensacola Bay. <laughs> now I'd have been like, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah. what it is. Oh man, but yeah, I, I I'm happy that 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 you're still here. Um, but shoot. We yeah, I I don't know if you could edit this, but we actually do have a story where people thought he was me and he did die. But he didn't die. <laughs> but he didn't die. It was, it, was, yeah. it was very crazy. I remember that night. Somebody died. It wasn't them, God rest his soul. But you know God what I mean? Soul, but I remember everybody thought we had been out that night and we had partied. And, but he wasn't with me that night. He was with someone else. But the word carried that. He had passed to his agent, to everybody, and everybody was talking. And then we had, uh, it's actually my wife's fault. <laughs> actually, I don't know how to think about it. God, God, she's good, but I remember that. <laughs> I remember that day. I, like, yeah, know. it was, it was, a, it was a, that was a crazy night because I remember I, I fell asleep on the couch. I didn't even go out that night. No. I fell, I literally fell asleep on the couch and I woke up to like 32 voicemails. And like um, probably 58 text messages. It was a uh, voicemail saying, Justin, where are you? We, we, we looking, what hospital are you in? Like, even if I was in the hospital, I was in the hospital. You know what I mean? But, I'm in this hospital. <laughs> Come see me. <laughs> but you know, those were one of the things I was talking about. Like, those moments right there shows me how much people care for you. Even if they don't show you on a daily basis, people do care yeah. about you, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that, that through that first year and the years after that kept me going is because there were people out there who cared about me, genuinely just cared about me. And mm -hmm. I felt like my climb out of that darkness was a message to them to show that I'm okay. I'm okay. Outside of your parents, did you have any other help? Not like a professional, like a friend who you spoke to on a daily basis or who might have gave you words of encouragement who you could say, hey, this, this, this dude really, I mean, I was still going out to get drunk right after I heard it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah he kept me on the ping. <laughs> I, I do. Uh, Duke. 
You, uh, you ever met Duke? Nah, before? I never met Duke. Duke, Duke if you're listening. He gonna be listening. <laughs> Bug me every damn day of my life. Duke Corshi, man. I, uh, I consider him a brother, man. He, when I met Duke, I thought he was gonna be one of those uh, the haters. You know, when you get like, you meet a group of friends yeah. and you become one of the friends in the group and you be like, all right, cool. And for whatever reason, it's always like a, 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 a color thing, right? Like he was the dark skinned guy of the group. <laughs> so here comes another dark skinned guy of the group. <laughs> So I feel like he was about to hate on me, right? But when I went through everything, man, the news broke and um, people started leaving my life. And me and Duke weren't even that close yet. When I tell you this man called me every day, he called me every morning, right? Every morning to check on me to make sure I was okay. Yeah, you need- that, He became a brother, man. Like, seriously. Man, we need people like Duke. Duke. Yeah, shoot, I am that guy. Everybody in the circle who meet me first, they always be like, I don't know why I don't like him. Then after I maybe meet them one-on-one, they'd be like, man, he's a really cool guy. He's a really cool guy. Because you're as loud as fuck. That's why. This is true. This is true. (laughs) How we first met, we met in our training camp. Uh, uh, Star Athletics, training with Dennis Mitchell. And I remember the first day you met him, he was like, Hey, man, my name is Justin Gatlin. And I was like, nigga, everybody know who you are. Everybody know who you are. But you got to realize from my, you gotta realize from my situation that, how does this sound? Hey, what's your name? Rodney? You know who I am, Rodney. I ain't got to tell you who I am. <laughs> I said, I'm Justin like, Gatlin, bro. You, you already like, know. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I was like, yes, my name is Justin Gatlin. I was like, did you have a job interview, bro, man? Put your spikes on. Put your spikes on. <laughs> But yeah, but but we've been cool ever since that day, man. I remember that day like yesterday. I can't remember exactly how we became close, but I feel like it was maybe I used to need a ride to practice because I always used to have uh I had like a problem with my license. So I needed a ride to practice sometimes and he would pick me up. So I feel like maybe some of those car rides uh maybe brought us closer. But I remember people telling me, man, don't be cool with that nigga, man. You don't know, man. And nigga, you mean that? <laughs> but funny thing with me is I always try to get the people, get to know people for myself. And I'm glad I didn't listen to a lot of those people. <laughs> I, I, like I told you, I'm not a mean person. It's just I don't tolerate certain shit. That's a difference. You know what I mean? I won't be kind. You know what I mean? I'm going to be nice. And on top of that, you my teammate, duh. Yeah. Like, I couldn't be me without you. So what, how's it going to look like me saying, nah, man, I can't give you a ride to the same damn destination I'm going to. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I had to watch out for my training partners because it's a cold world out nah, there. Nah, you, you did do that. And that's, 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 that's something I can't pay you back for, but I highly appreciate, my family and myself highly appreciate you for it. Um, but yeah, man, back, back to that year. Uh, what was Christmas like? Your first Christmas? Knowing, yeah, what was that Christmas like the first year? That first birthday, what was that like? Hollow. Every joyous occasion was hollow. When you turn 25, and I'm jumping ahead a couple years, but when you turn 25, it's a special moment for people, right? Milestone. A very, very big milestone. Hollow. Hollow. It um every birthday, especially that first one, I didn't want to do anything. I don't want to celebrate anything. Christmas, I, I felt like I was Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did, man. Like it was just like everything that would remind you of being happy made me sad. Mm-hmm. Because I wasn't happy. So uh, you got to realize my, within that first year, I lost everything in a blink of an eye. I lost every sponsor. I had to pack up, move home. That was in, moving home was in the first year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
I, you know my parents, man, they ain't play that shit. Oh, mm-hmm. hell no. You bring your ass home. <laughs> Come home. You know, within, within the next year, I was like, look, I'm a grown man. I can't be living in the house with y'all. So I got a home, but I was still in Pensacola, but I was renting a home in Pensacola mm-hmm. at that time. But, you know, when you, when you build and you work hard for a certain lifestyle and a standard, and then you can't meet that for whatever reason, it makes you feel some type of way, you know? So everything just felt numb. And uh, I just hated being me at that point in time. I just hated it. That should sound like a really, really empty year, but you had to have a tough spirit to get through that. Shoot, I think maybe 10, 10 20% of men was doing a towel. So it goes to show how tough you are and how that translates throughout the rest of your life or how you, you keep fighting because that's just your spirit, warrior spirit. You know what I mean? But a few men wouldn't have made it out of that situation if they had the same, same burden that you had to carry. But I had a standard to live up to, man. Um, if I just had a regular, normal career and I didn't amount to any real success just yet, I would listen to my parents who told me, you tell track and field to kiss your black ass. You don't owe them nothing. You keeping all your medals and your money. You good, right? But I told my mom, I was like, nah, man. I, I built myself to be great. And I don't want to have to justify to anybody for the rest of my life. Hey, man, why you, hey, man, why you driving FedEx trucks? Or, hey, man, why you doing this? You, man, you, you was amazing back then. What happened? You already know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like regardless if I was going to win and come back, I still had to fight. That was my, like, real, like, primal urge was like, I'm fighting this shit. I'm fighting it all the way. You know, I look back at it and be like, yeah, I spent like over a million dollars in lawyer fees, but it was for something that I believed in, I fought for. I felt like if I really did that shit, I'd be like, shit, I'm keeping my money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, all right, yeah, y'all yeah. got me. All right, cool. <laughs> I'll sit out. I'll be chill. Yeah, why, why spend the money if you, you know what I mean? Exactly. If you, if you feel like it was, okay, I, I get that. Question. Possibly the last one. What the last year of it, and you realize you were going to try to come back, what was the driving force? And you realize 365 days, when that's done, I am free to actually do what I love again. Just being free. Just to be able to run again, compete again. I didn't know what was in store for me. And on the other side of that freedom was actually even worse than just being away from the sport. Um but I was just happy to do what I loved, which was compete and run fast. Now, mind you, I didn't put on 20 pounds, <laughs> you know, so. I remember I saw you. <laughs> I saw, actually, I ran in Estonia and you ran like a week later and I was in a hotel in like Estonia. And I was like, oh boy, that boy don't got a chance, boy. We gonna eat that boy. <laughs> 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 I remember when I started training again, the joke was, and I got a nickname like the first week I was there, it went from Gatlin to Fatlin. I was Fatlin. So, but it was okay though, you know, because I knew that it was going to be a process of me getting back into the shape I needed to. And it was a challenge and it was a goal. It was all these things that I didn't have for the last four years. Like I was numb. Now all of a sudden, you're telling me I can compete. You're telling me I can run. You're telling me I can socialize and lift weights with other, other athletes again. 
Like, I became alive. Reborn. Reborn, man. Determined. Mm. I became hungry. It, like I said, after I got that news that I was able to come back and compete again, I didn't realize that it was going to be an even harder challenge for me mentally and emotionally competing again. Made you respect what you do because for so long, possibly you were on the high end, so it came so easy. Not saying you didn't work hard, but to maintain the success was easy. But because you were removed, you couldn't maintain that same success. So you basically started almost from the bottom running times that you ran in high school on a professional level. And that's fine. I'm a very optimistic kind of person. To know that I'm running times that I, I ran before, I know that blueprint. I'll run these times again because I know that I can build myself to be better and stronger again. All right, man. We're going to pick this up again. For sure. You ready? But I ain't the one talking. <laughs> All right. Well, if you ready, tell everybody else to be ready. Stay tapped in. Stay tuned in. Because we're about to go deep. And it's ready, set, go. <laughs>